Hello, welcome. My name is Neha Vazakha and I'm the host of the podcast series The Feminist City. This is offered by Vidhi Center for Legal Policy and in the series we think about cities, our relationships with the city and exclusions in the city. My guest today is Dr. Naveen Bharati. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Advanced Study of India at the University of Pennsylvania. His work is at the intersection of political sociology and political economy of identity in India. His research explores the relationship between ethnic diversity and development. Prior to this, he has previously worked as an architect and urban planner. Hi Naveen. Hi Sneha. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, it's nice to talk about my work. Uh, happy to uh sort of discuss my work with you yeah thanks a lot so uh navin could you tell me just and our listeners just about your work in your own words what what you do and the introduction i gave is a formal one i'd love to know in in like to hear you talk about the kind of work that you do uh my work is with uh, uh my co-authors are deepak and andleeb Uh, so i work with them on residential segregation in india in indian cities urban india and also we also work on rural residential segregation too uh, but mostly our uh, work is on uh, bangalore and few other cities in india so uh, the first uh, major uh, discovery was the basic premise that urbanization uh, will dissolve caste boundaries or even the caste hierarchy Uh, which was yeah. essentially the idea of the founding fathers of this uh, nation like including baba saheb ambedkar or even nehruvian idea of industrialization urbanization to dissolve uh, the so called parochial identities and merge into a caste from uh, merge into a class identity from a caste identity right so yeah we for the first time show that actually the size of the city doesn't really matter like if you are living in a small town of uh, say 50000 and you might be living in a, a big city or like delhi or bombay with around 20 million population you still uh, the, the 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 amount of residential segregation doesn't really change so essentially a dalit in a smaller city will also live in a segregated neighborhood and a dalit in a bigger city will also live in a segregated neighborhood okay so that's the first, uh, uh, kind of contributions of our research the second aspect is uh, in, in terms of bangalore we were the first uh, research to visualize residential segregation we we used the first time the block level data the research previous research has been only using ward level data for the first time we use census enumeration block which is a small unit uh, to study okay. and understand residential segregation and uh, what did you find out in terms of bangalore how did the segregation sort of could you explain a little bit about that uh, in terms of are there specific areas where uh, you saw sp- i mean you know concentrations of specific communities how did you go about doing this because i mean just just to clarify this is the paper that, you, that you've written on the residential segregation patterns in indian metros right i think uh, if yeah. this no, fact of no, urbanism no. yeah epw paper but we also have kind of a recently uh, there's a new working paper on how we, we kind of sort of see the relationship between segregation and public goods provisioning mostly water and sanitation in bangalore Uh, okay so that paper is still uh, uh, in in working stages but it will be out soon as a working paper uh, so in bangalore per se bangalore has a history of bangalore as a city as a history of around 202 around say yeah around 200 to 250 years but it was a small town before that during like the like historically the kempegowda's time and all but mostly like if we take 1790 to the anglo mysore war that's when bangalore city started really growing the one was the pete the fort area and the yeah. other, other area was when the british conquered uh, bangalore uh, it was the cantonment right uh, the correct city. yeah two cities in bangalore always uh, only after independence the two cities merged to become one bigger city the the vidhan sauda the high court were the one uh, the buildings the civic buildings are the ones which connected the the pete area which is essentially yeah. 
the indian town and the colon the directly administered uh, by the madras presidency was the cantonment so uh, the culturally they were very very different uh, someone from a pete area required a permit to even enter the cantonment so this was how it was oh, uh, wow okay so the the today's yeah. mg road richmond although that area was under the fort uh, the cantonment so essentially what happened the uh, the old city the pete area was also segregated along caste lines even today if you see uh, the names of the uh, localities in that area were essentially based on caste even the francis buchanan's uh, travel log and everything other few other okay. colonial records also show that uh, the old city was segregated along caste lines like you have uh, tigalar pete you have lot of other petes which are essentially cotton pete was for weavers and uh, merchants the nagarth pete was for traders so they were like different caste uh, uh segregated along caste lines now also if you see, if you want to see the street like if you go towards the the old bang door where the avenue road and few other roads you can still see the caste name still on the, named on the roads and other uh, localities so what happened was also during that time when uh, the princely state was under ruling in the after like 1898 in the 1882 was when the princely state took over from the british direct colonial administration from the commissioners so called commissioners so after that yeah. what happened was there was plague in uh, bangalore right the major plague in bangalore so that was when your baswan gudi chamraj pet those come about right that this was when okay. planned so when these localities were planned they were also kind of uh, planned on caste lines right for baswan oh. gudi for that matter even in the 1890s it was sort of designed in such a way that brahmins stayed in a different uh <laughs> sector of basun gudi and lingayats stayed in a different sector of basun gudi the muslim dalits everyone stayed in a different part of basun gudi so uh, the, wow, okay. uh, even chamraj pet was also similarly designed in such a way and also little later malleshwaram comes about malleshwaram was also very bra- even today for example is a very brahmin dominated locality because brahmins were one of the first uh caste to migrate to urban areas because of the opportunities where they had in the prince the government jobs and few other jobs right of so course so yeah how it was and dalits the dalits and everyone lived a little far away from the city uh, right okay yeah this has been documented by various uh geographers and few other research which happened during that time so what happened okay. after that was like after 1947 there was a boom like bangalore became the uh, science and technology city that like lot of public sector companies were established in bangalore uh, so what happened was even then uh, the jainagar was planned right jainagar was one of the asia's largest planned residential localities at that time yeah. uh, so even then the, the people who could really settled in those neighborhoods were essentially who could get jobs in such institutions the government institution central government institution or the state government you know essentially upper caste right yeah 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 so this is the basic history of bangalore but what happens is slowly there are a lot of other localities where kind of and bangalore is a very organic city so it's not being planned really well so a lot of localities which keep on growing in the periphery and the city has grown like that so even after the 1991 my research shows that for even today for that matter basun gudi has a very less uh, dalit population right okay uh, yeah it hasn't changed after the say that basun gudi came about in 1890s uh, yeah but even today the composition has not really changed got it yeah, yeah. question i think oh, one of the things that i was that i found really interesting in your research or some of the articles that i've read uh, where you talked about this is 
how you sort of talk about how even if earlier it was overtly uh, based on caste lines now post independence it's it's the segregation still continues to persist but through access to economic opportunities right so i was actually curious about could you just talk a little bit about that because at the end of the day the segregation continues to persist on caste based lines and we've not yet touched upon religion yet in terms of how that operates right, in the yeah. city mm-hmm. but how did that yeah in the in the in the shifting of uh, because i mean i think we are aware of there are state governments or our constitution takes into account uh, you know identity based discrimination and allows for policies by the government to make interventions right so has that was there any consciousness to do this in the case of housing or planning itself of the city yeah that was just the other question i had uh, the constitution uh, two things as i discussed earlier people who migrated into cities in the early years of independence in bangalore for that matter or any other city were the upper caste because they yeah. were the next, meaning that it's not necessarily true generally because a lot of lower caste also migrated to cities for example uh, baba saheb ambedkar's caste mahars for that matter yeah. were one of the first dalit caste to migrate to cities uh, so even that way in, in bangalore or uh, that way that the jobs which were created by the booming say the scientific establishment or the public sector jobs were essentially uh, kind of were taken up by upper caste mostly like brahmins or even other upper caste for that matter so what has yeah. happened so that's exactly why the lower uh, the older areas are essentially dominated by uh, upper caste even today got it right? yeah so okay yeah exactly why because to even to get educated during that time and also this also to do a lot to do with the history of the city and history of karnataka per se also right for example yeah. to, uh, until 1919 that's when the millers committee report came so before that yeah. most of the government jobs were had only brahmins so when the 1919 when the millers mm-hmm. committee report was uh, kind of uh implemented it was implemented over 10 years uh 10 to 12 years it was not fully implemented but still it opened up a lot of jobs for lot of non brahmin upper caste for that matter like the lingayats and vakas okay. so they also could sort of because of this opened up opportunities for them they also could become come to cities get educated get these salary jobs be in the city right so this Got is explain yeah. how the older uh, cities were uh, older part of the city is segregated uh, so Correct. yeah when you come to the n- uh, new cities and also also you should also know that uh, the constitution also guarantees that you can form associations right that also means you can form yeah and the house of course uh, housing for that matter from the long time you had housing board lot of other government uh organizations which was in charge of planning and housing right yeah the, yeah you was there like a lot of other uh, or, uh, institutions or even the, uh, so what happened after independence a lot of cooperative societies also come about got it yeah so essentially what when you have a cooperative society uh, even to uh, when and they also got involved in real estate sort of buying plots and distributing plots among so what happened was those sort of uh, urban development or even that sort of planning gave rise to segregated neighborhoods uh, even for yeah. example if you go to any kind of uh, cooperative most of them are kind of are highly segregated like you find only one caste for that matter like that's true uh, for example the uh, so also what happened was slowly in bangalore uh, government took a back seat in urban planning and urban development right in housing and other and the mm-hmm. real estate yeah. uh, comes about uh, real estate the private real estate companies come about so when they also come their interest is not essentially in maintaining the diversity uh, there is a rule uh, in, uh, in various state governments or even when you do housing what you have to do is you have to make lig housing a percentage of your development uh, 
new locality or a new neighborhood or even a new apartment yeah. place has to be reserved for lower income group lig housing correct yeah, yeah. so but what essentially happens is that lig plot uh, they are they are when you do the design and planning it's shown on paper that this many apartments are reserved for lig but essentially they combine two flats and make it a like a bigger flat and which is sold to a different uh, it, it's sold to one single person so essentially lot of this uh, gave gives rise to residential segregation as we see it today and also we should also okay. know that in indian scenario class and caste completely overlap and i the class hierarchy yeah. class hierarchy even after the bangalore's it boom the so called it boom the it boom has been only uh, beneficial to few castes right there are a lot of studies which say yeah. that was ar vasavi and kerala dias study there are a lot of studies which show that the people who work in these it companies i mean uh, are mostly from upper caste dominant caste and the the kind of the globalization or the benefits of globalization has not really reached the lower or the subaltern caste right Got it. so this yeah. will essentially reflect in your housing too right for example the white field for that matter when we see white field from my own data set you find very less dalits in those neighborhoods it brings the next question that i have is the impact of this kind of uh, development and segregation on the communities who live in these areas themselves and specifically i know that the research doesn't specifically look at gender but i was curious to hear how does this impact uh, uh, people in the in the communities like in in terms of just access to basic urban infrastructure services and you know because i think one of the things that i i have noticed while i was i mean going over your work and some of the others that uh, you asked me to look at is just the sheer impact of just where you live in a city has on your ability to access opportunities both for personal social and economic development right so and i also wanted to understand when when we have a private housing market and what are the potential solutions outside of something like you know when we live in these kinds of ghetto cities in what are what are some of the ways forward i was I, i'm really interested in hearing yeah way forward i think that's a larger question there so we i think we should all discuss together as a you know, social scientists planners Uh, the government agencies but let's i will talk about that later but like what is the yeah. effect of segregation on people I mean, there is a lot of enough research on us cities for that matter right yeah. like raj chetty the economist and like few other people have shown that like if you uh, the uh, your neighborhood essentially kind of can determine your earnings later in life meaning how how much economic development or how much Uh, career uh, progression is essentially linked to which neighborhood you live essentially in a, in a way explaining the social capital which a neighborhood can give right yeah. and that's one major uh, kind of like when you live in a very segregated neighborhood this is for subaltern cars you hardly have good infrastructure for that matter good drinking water good sanitation any other public good there's one aspect the other thing is that access to other services like schools hospitals uh, all that so when uh, yeah. this, it will have an impact on the lives of the people who live in such neighborhoods right? yeah and also yeah. in in another larger sense uh, uh, kind of uh, the other side is also true the other people who kind of live in a ghetto that that's also a ghetto upper caste ghetto or upper class ghetto so you actually yeah. grow up uh, immune to a uh, completely a different way of living or a completely different aspect of indian cities right you can still be in india yeah. not come across uh, not meet a dalit or you can be in basant yeah. you can not meet a muslim so this is a largely what happens is this will give rise to the uh, larger politics which we see today right like a complete distrust of yeah. communities complete distrust like the violence or even the residential kind of and i didn't touch another aspect uh, which I mean that is essentially to do with uh, muslims for that matter a lot of communal riots yeah. also have given rise to 
segregation for example okay. ahmedabad for that matter even in bangalore for that matter like in bangalore yeah. there were a lot of riots in 90s there was a urdu news which happened and there was a lot of riots so i know in, in my kind of when i went for my field visits i have met muslim families who migrated from a hindu dominated neighborhoods just so that they could feel safe right yeah. they have to sell their houses with in a uh, in throw away prices and then move into a muslim because of the safety reasons so this also happens communal yeah. life also give rise to segregated neighborhoods uh, so yeah dalits also what another aspect of well, food habits for that matter right like people that we were only rent to vegetarians Uh, all the yeah. give rise to residential segregation in a way that like uh, in, in being live in any city or any community for a long time any so you, it's very easy to decipher one's caste like you just need to ask them what do they eat what's your father's name what's your mother's name where do they work which locality you are from so in a way that absolutely a way, yeah way of uh, kind of identifying someone's caste so you do you need not have to see his caste certificate to identify someone's caste and their social and their position in the social hierarchy so in a way that yeah they don't think that they are of self but they do think when they have to sort of rent it out all that too specific no no absolutely i i mean i i am a renter in bangalore when i was looking for a house almost i think 7 to 10 uh, people that i'd call the first question is are you vegetarian or it it immediately i think for me one i one thing i noticed was immediately this like you know this question about diet and i mean there were a couple of people who just straight up came out and said don't be shy what is your caste and i was horrified because a lot of these people were english speaking educated people you know it's it's not uh, there wasn't i mean not to say that just because if you're educated you know you're somehow not caste east but it's yeah it's just that it, there was it was a very aware and like you know conscious uh, bias so uh, how difficult it would be yeah paper by professor dev tarat uh, i think it's in epw Uh, so okay. they, they study delhi's housing market so what they do is they call up randomly various real estate agents and with fake names like having a dalit name a surname or having a muslim name and the probability okay. of you getting a house is very low if you are a dalit or a muslim mostly like muslims is still worse uh, so if you are a dalit and a muslim it is like the probability of you uh, kind of getting a house for rent is lesser compared to an upper caste or a dominant caste yeah. uh, family yeah. so yeah so how the various ways of discrimination how it happens and and essentially also to do with like outrightly even you can see advertisements showing that we only want brahmins for my not only yeah and also there are a lot of new residential uh, neighborhoods which are being designed which outrightly say it's only for brahmins and that's allowed in a sense in a way that the supreme court various supreme court judgments have told that your right to form a kind of group is also it's in constitution i think as a lawyer you might know better that it's yeah so in the what yeah. happened there was one a parsi cooperative society and what happened was one of the members wanted to sell the house to someone else some non parsi right and the mm-hmm. community objected to that they wanted him to sell the house to a parsi Uh, but yeah. they went to court and finally supreme court upheld uh, the opinion of the uh, parsi community uh, telling that the yeah. house has to be sold to a parsi so essentially yeah. it is I mean, it's a bit tricky in a sense that you see that like that happen you can see that the residential neighborhoods in bangalore being owned planned for only brahmins or only for lingayats etc that was quite alarming to hear and i'm i'm, I'm actually i'm when you were talking about how you know it would be really difficult for uh, somebody who's a dalit and a muslim to find a house i was actually wondering you know just the impact of women and girls who live in these communities right because i think one of the things from i briefly worked in hyderabad and there um, the issue with even segregated or ghettoized neighborhoods is that the state of public infrastructure and urban infrastructure is just worse in certain areas than others and they usually tend to be poorer uh, areas where there isn't maybe the bus stops are not you know they don't they don't exist in good repair 
there are no public sanitation facilities there is a problem with access to water right. and these inevitably yeah seem to impact the girls and women in these yeah. neighborhoods because yeah because even it was kind of most of them sort of uh, like the responsibility of managing a household is on the shoulders of women so when, yeah. when you kind of in live in a neighborhood with no uh, it, proper public infrastructure as you are telling or not safe Uh, which yeah. really impact them. Uh, so you have to deal with getting water to run your household. You have to deal with getting a lot of other infrastructure. So it yeah. definitely impact a lot of women. And like even today, if you see in any kind of neighborhood with very less or very poor public infrastructure, like you see the women really kind of uh, working hard to get some water. I have enough photographs. Uh, from my field study that people the, the responsibility of getting water as simple as that falls on the shoulders of the woman in the household for some reason yeah so that's in yeah. all in fact uh, women yeah yeah i mean the reason i think it's essentially gender roles right like the yeah. domestic Absolutely. sphere inevitably has to be the the woman who has to take care of it right. yeah and uh, thank you so much this was this was really a very enlightening conversation and i guess i what i would only like want to conclude the conversation just this just to think together with you about the role of laws uh, themselves right i think one of the things that even while we talked about recently there were uh, there was a uh, there are disturbances or you know public violence in certain whether it's the use of curfew laws all of these things seem to have a geographic concentration so that so much so that the political economy of a neighborhood is constantly disrupted or and then just the way in which criminal laws uh, operate in in their operation which has specific impacts in the city as well as i think planning i i would like to just hear i mean because you're also an architect and a planner right i would like to know your perspective on what is the unthinking aspect of the law because sometimes as you mentioned when we have something as freedom of association which looks amazing on paper but in translation or in in practice that inevitably i mean that seems to create societies which perpetuate caste based uh, housing or segregation so how do planning laws themselves take into account the diversity and 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 address social inequality because i think uh, land and housing is highly contested in cities so I'm, i'm just interested if you in your work come across how different countries have done it or what is a good way of addressing the historic and systemic injustice in this regard oh so, uh, yeah you been just to be one before that like if i'm going to how laws can change like for example even the planning education in india right So yeah you, you only speak of urban poor you never even mention it's easy to like even you can get a planning degree without even studying sociology uh, urban sociology for that matter like you, you most of the stress is on physical planning right and yeah this has given rise to a caste blind uh, professional group which does the, which they don't even think of caste or religion for that matter yeah so and, and other thing is also kind of to enforce law more uh, transparently for for example like as i as i was telling you one of the ngos in bangalore the very famous ngos in bangalore they had a new housing development uh, which we went here the electronic city so essentially there also in the last it, it was i visited like last 8 years back or so there also the houses which were reserved for lig were essentially converted uh, essentially the houses had to go to auto drivers uh, vegetable vendors those houses were essentially joined together to give it to a software engineers because it was near okay. and it was cheaper for them to buy two houses and convert it into a big apartment so essentially the <laughs> architect that also means the architects are hand in glove with the builder yeah so uh, okay. in a sense that you have to really be kind of the rules and also sort of the cooperative societies are a bit unwieldy and the state government yeah. comes into the state government right so they have to really sort of see uh, kind of how when they give permission for housing societies 
uh, how they can make sure that the membership is diverse right yeah. the, the the rule requires i think if i am right i might be, i have not studied much the rule requires that you need a sc and st member in the governing body of the cooperative society but that doesn't really specify the particular percentage has to be held to sc or st you might be you might be knowing more about that so essentially but there is a rule where the governing body must have a dalit member but doesn't really specify the percentage of members to be got it uh the okay. or uh, st and also there's also a yeah. lot of the now real estate developers right because it's so much profit yeah. uh oriented you can't really blame them too because so because the government has given up completely on uh doing urban new residential neighborhoods so it's very important that the government has because the even even now like to up, get a bda plot is more difficult than getting uh, i would say like any other major achievement right it's a big achievement to get yeah. a plot so you, you won't get that easily but if you see in my study like i can really see if it's a government developed uh locality i mean that recently yeah. after 8 1980s or 1990s there is there is decent diversity in that right okay because yeah. sort of when you i think they also do follow some sort of a reservation when they a lot uh sites but the government yes. has completely like there hardly any uh, new residential uh developments done by the government agencies and also mired with lot of controversies for that matter not essentially with residential irrigation even today yeah. for that matter even many of the public institutions or even jobs they are taking on contract basis so when you take on Correct. contract basis you may not have to follow the affirmative action norms so Correct. yeah people get away uh, uh, by and also any any way privatization impacts people from the bottom right Correct. And, yeah so yeah of course and it's true with uh, in, in, in india too like if yeah, uh, yeah. like if tomorrow if there is privatization of water that was uh, kind of uh, that started happening in mysore in my city but i don't know if it's still there it was given to tatas to uh, tatas were given the responsibility to supply water the, the, the mysore is a, one of the oldest public water uh, supply department which is called vani vilasa water supplies which was com- uh, kind of now uh, 10 years back it was called uh, jesco jamshedpur urban i don't completely remember so now it. I know whether it has been given back to the state government but of course when you do that essentially uh, he is not Uh, the person the private entity is not interested in a slum gets water or not he is in he is interested in whether he is able to collect bills and all that so yeah for example the it's... supreme court order which is telling about the parsi society so now anybody yeah. from a society and be blatantly casteist right yeah Because, but also yeah. the constitution also says a market cannot discriminate right if it's a market but of course this also gives right to farming associations yeah and the mysore's jesco case is quite i mean i think now they have got a kind of contract ended or something they didn't renew the contract but you can look it up also could you talk a little bit about residential segregation based on religion particularly you know the muslim community in say in the indian cities notably bangalore yeah so uh, muslims in indian cities are highly segregated like you including many major cities like uh, delhi uh, ahmedabad few other cities too uh, bangalore is also muslims are highly segregated uh, in kind of few neighborhoods in central part of the city and few other neighborhoods in the periphery and <clears throat> also what happened during the bombay riots a lot of muslim communities from bombay migrated to bangalore and they have formed okay. neighborhoods in the outer parts of the city and in my study muslims are more segregated than dalits in bangalore uh, 
and also as i told oh. you earlier in the 90s there were a lot of riots uh, on a kind of hindu muslim riots and essentially that segregated the city further and it also happened in amdabad amdabad is a city where uh, there have been a lot of communal riots over many years after independence so there also what has happened is like muslims have been completely even the elite muslims have moved towards the older part of the city which has become a muslim ghetto and you can also okay. sort of see but also that kind of few other cities are not really segregated like lucknow for that matter is not yeah really segregated along the religion lines and it also comes up when you see communal riots uh, uh, you see surat or lucknow doesn't have any communal riots but amdabad yeah. has communal riots so but as you can also see that the uh, there is a paper by uh, rafael suswain who goes in sees into neighborhood level religion data and he also shows that uh, the residence segregation in amdabad is one of the highest in and that also true in my yeah. own study of indian cities along caste lines gujarat cities like surat amdabad vadodara etc are highly segregated along caste lines too I meaning dalits uh, like uh, almost like 80% of amdabad neighborhood doesn't have any dalits at all so yeah back to muslims in bangalore as i told you uh, because of uh, the house the, the, the kind of to find a house uh, it's very difficult uh, for if you are yeah. mango like there are lot of personal histories like few journalists muslim journalists in kannada in kannada press they have written a lot yeah. about how it was difficult for them to find houses uh, in bangalore yeah uh, kind of okay. sort of in my own field study kind of there is a complete distrust of muslim community when it comes to uh renting houses or even having them as neighbors yeah. so this sort of and again as i told you earlier this will again uh, this is a cycle this distrust increase further with residential segregation because you hardly come across a muslim family or a muslim person and you have all these stereotypes in your head like muslim is like this muslim face of face cap always muslim always eats a biryani so all these sort of caricatures are made in your mind uh, in the manner also the yeah. media portrayal of muslim and you hardly know how what a muslim family is what are their beliefs and how they live and this kind of when yeah. it completely kind of the stereotypes keep on reinforcing with residential segregation so that way it's really yeah. residential segregation and also because of this it's easy to target communities during communal raids because you know this is sort of the neighborhood uh, where muslim uh, muslims live or christians live and it's easy to target so yeah yeah that way it's very kind it's, of if you want to build a very safe and uh, equitable city this has to be addressed uh, yeah. and while while that to say personal history like well growing up i never had a muslim classmate in my 12th standard No, that is quite alarming. And like you said, I mean, for me, my experience was slightly different because growing up in Hyderabad, it was a much, it was a very different experience than I say. I think growing up in Bangalore would have been in terms of um, this kind of thing. But I think you're right. Like I think not studying with people from different, not growing up with, right? Like from children or like people from communities that are different from your own. Just you can like live your entire life not really understanding or being exposed to how. people live that are not you know that don't carry your identity and and i think it also sort of serves to prevent people from mingling with each other even i mean now I'm, i i don't think we can discuss this at all without talking about the bhugi of lau jihad which actually it's 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 shocking that they're like using this law that they've passed on forcible religious conversions to target young couples in you know uttar pradesh and uh, the only thing that i wanted to add was basically that this also becomes like 
a way in which you, you know, women's bodies are controlled and policed in terms of who you can meet. There are all these ideas about the right kind of person and the wrong kind of person that you're supposed to be mingling with, which which are fueled by the same kinds of horrible, you know, stereotypes. And I mean, the uh, the only other thing that I think I just wanted to add to this is, you know, uh, there was this article, I think I'll uh, include this as well on Ahmedabad and how the you know, ghettoization of Muslims took place and there are references to, to the Disturbed Areas Act. Mm-hmm. These that two referred three major uh, studies. One is Ashutosh Vashne's book. Okay. And yeah. The other is Christopher Jaffalo's book and the other is Rafael Suswine's work. Yeah. Okay. All three yeah. put them in the links and these are all also very accessible and, and like uh, Ashutosh Vashne's, you can give a link to a paper of his, or who speaks on how, like, in various cities, there is some sort of a economic, socio-economic relationship which happens in Lucknow. It happened yeah. in, uh, say, in Ahmedabad. So, I, uh, also, about speaking about segregated neighborhoods, I, we see a lot of people who grow up in these neighborhoods and we say that, uh, what about caste? I, I don't really understand why caste is such an important aspect of Indian life and we see this sort of people in our own circles. We who have never experienced what is caste all their lives but for someone else from uh, across the street it's it's an everyday experience. So yeah, kind of uh, yeah. You, you end up being caste blind all these privileges you become blind to your own privileges of being a upper caste Hindu male in any given a neighborhood, right? This is very important. Yeah. That, uh, uh, that, that's why diversity becomes so important uh, in neighborhood. Yeah. It's also, I mean, that you mentioned, I mean, that's, I think, one of the things in this podcast, like, I think the feminist or urbanist method or approach is precisely to account for the day-to-day life because the experience of identity affects every aspect of your life. And I was actually thinking in terms of caste, I mean, the fact that we have restaurants in our cities where pure veg is like a thing, like which which is directly the you know Brahmanical notion of purity and impurity that is you know inscribed into our buildings and our menu cards and our university hostels. Uh, the thing is, the non-veg is a entirely an Indian word because the veg is the norm. And- yeah. And anything not is non veg. But you don't say non if something is not cold, you don't say non cold, you say it hot, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Veganism becomes a norm and non vegetarian becomes the deviant here. But if it's yeah. India is predominantly a meat eating society, right? Yeah. But the whole point it's... is the kind of the the supremacy also comes from what food you eat. All that. So that's a problem. Yeah. Our cities are not representative of the majority of the cities, but they're the ideas that sort of end up in our buildings, in our you know boards, are represent a minority yeah. uh, identity, but one that is very privileged and powerful yeah. in this context. <laughs> yeah. Calcutta, almost 60% of Calcutta's neighborhood doesn't have any Dalits. And also, Calcutta has the least percentage of Dalits. Uh, in I many urbanized Dalits, right? So, yeah, in a way, it hides this sort of underbelly without I many. You can be to Kolkata and live all your life without even seeing a Dalit family. Uh, people yeah. want to say that Bengal is a casteless society, but it's not. <laughs> uh, which is, uh, yeah. No, it's. And I think, I mean, just to, it's, I mean, part of this issue is also that the statues we see, the names of our streets, the the way in which whose identities and which communities values are, you know, reflected in our cities is also something that I think we should question. The problem is not new. Like, even if you go back to 1930s, uh, if you know, Sir Mizza, the one of the major contributors to Bangalore, the city per se, to this growth, to its beautification, was Sir Mirza Ismail, who was a Diwan of Mysore for a long period during Krishna Raja Wadiyar 4. Right? Okay. So, 
Yeah. The thing is, uh, it was a norm in Mysore uh, to when during the Dasara celebrations for the Diwan to sit on the howdah with the Maharaja, right? And, oh, uh, okay. Maharaja would sit in the front and the Diwan would sit in the back, and they were classmates. And Krishna Ji would hear like him a lot, and uh, sort of he was a de facto ruler actually. Sir Mizza Ismail was a de facto ruler of <laughs> Mysore Prithvi State, and. During the procession, stones were pelted at the Maharaja and the Mirza Ismail because he was a Muslim, right? Oh my God! And, okay. Oh wow! And, and also during his time, uh, there were Bangalore riots, uh, Hindu-Muslim riots, accusing Sir Mirza Ismail as someone who favored Muslims, and this had to do okay. with a lot of uh, the great Gandhians. <laughs> of that particular thing. Right? Oh. Like, like, for example, Tandur okay. Ramchandra Rao, uh, a great Gandhian, who became an anti-caste leader later, a uh, Brahmin leader later. So what happened was, uh, Ganesh temple was put in front of uh, a Muslim uh, counselor, city counselor. Oh. Okay. okay. And the city counselor tried to remove it and that resulted in Uh, Bangalore riots. Okay. Right. And uh, in a way that was done to sort of tarnish the image of Sir Mirza Ismail. And Sir Mirza Ismail, so the DNA of the Bangalore has been always been this contested sort of a very, it's not new. Yeah. Like Sir Mirza Ismail, such a, this contribution to Bangalore for that matter, like he is the one, the whole He's the one who got Kumbra Eagle, who, who did all the landscaping of Bangalore, the, all the beautiful trees, gardens, which you see, is essentially Mirza Ismail's idea. Okay. That's, right. But have wow. you seen any yeah. building named after him? <laughs> no, I haven't. I mean, I, unfortunately, yeah. I, I doesn't come up. I mean, it might be it's there. <laughs> I'm not telling it's not there. Some street might have been named after him, but his contribution... Yeah, per se, Bangalore is immense. He's the one who uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, established a lot of the factories in Bangalore. The, all that happened only due to Sir Mirza Ismail, the beautiful building. So, yeah. Yeah. This, this is not new. Uh, thank you so much, Naveen, for speaking to me today. This was a very engaging and uh, enlightening conversation and I learned a lot about Bangalore that you know I'm, I'm guilty of not knowing as well. I think it made me realize how much how important it is to understand the history you know of a city when you yeah to when, when you're living in it so thank you so much for yeah for speaking with me today thanks a lot Sneha it's been a pleasure uh, all the best for your other podcasts Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, for those who are listening, um, uh, I will include all the readings that we discussed over the course of this episode in the reading list. And please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and listen to us uh, so that you can catch the upcoming episodes as well. Thanks a lot.